and welcome to the Volney Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your host, Shane, uh, coming to you from the group of the Paznia, the Sofa Raiders Paradise. Uh, to learn more about the Second Realm Network, uh, just visit Paznia, P-A-Z-N-I-A dot com, uh, or find our committee of correspondence on Telegram. Uh, that link is t.me forward slash Paznia chat, uh, or again, Paznia dot com for everything uh, the free republic. Uh, in terms of happenings here at Veritas Pasnia, our next gathering of liberation is July 1st to July, 4, uh, to July 4th, our uh, Anarchy Day weekend celebration. Uh, as always, any and all vetted self liberators are encouraged to attend. Uh, and if you happen uh, to need vetted for, say, Vani Fest here at Veritas, uh, you can come see Aura and I at the rapidly approaching Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest in Gaines, Michigan. Uh, this must-attend must event uh, takes place from July 21st to July 25th. Uh, the website is mplfest.org. And uh, I do believe early registration prices are still available, and you can pay in Bitcoin, too, which I do highly recommend. And make sure you coin join it before you send it. Um, for the vetting process, come out to the LU Publications of uh, Vanu, Pasnia, or as Apothecary Tent. Uh, chat it up with us, and uh, if we get a good feel for you, uh, we might uh, just uh, get you an invite. Uh, otherwise, we need to find a colleague in common uh, that can vouch for vouch, that will uh, vouch for your reputation, uh, or I guess the slow way, uh, building a reputation up in the Pasnia Committee of Correspondence. Uh, but yeah, I'm super excited for the MPL Fest, uh, as I am every year. Uh, it's always amazing to uh, catch up with longtime volunteers, friends, and colleagues. Uh, and uh, the in-person conversations help to facilitate many interesting uh, strategizing discussions in the realm of self-liberation. Uh, anyway, I do hope to see you there, uh, as well as uh, at Vani Fest. Uh, without further ado, today I welcome back our friend and hardware hacker, uh, Jamin Baconic, uh, to the podcast. Uh, I figured it was about time for an overall ghost system uh, update, since he's making some great progress. Uh, and of course, an update on the Freedom Box specifically, uh, as it is the foundation for the coming new Pasnia Committee correspondence. Uh, I know it's all coming together in my head for me, uh, so maybe this discussion can further solidify uh, how the ghost system can help you lock down your privacy and security, uh, and primarily the digital realm, but also the, the physical too, obviously, because uh, there's certainly plenty of overlap in both. Uh, but that said, I figure we'll start with uh, some homesteading updates and uh, see where the conversation goes. Uh, then later on, uh, we'll get to uh, the more dense technical content. So, uh, Jamin, welcome back to the Vani Podcast, brother. Uh, how are you on this? Uh, I guess uh, in my outline, I have, I have uh, what, Sunday? But I guess it's Friday now. Um, how, how are you on this fine Friday? Oh, pretty good, man. Um, yeah, it's been kind of hot here, but uh, the weather kind of broke a little bit. So at least I'm not melting. Mm -hmm. But... Um, We've just been working on the homestead. This is kind of the wind down of all of the uh, intensive spring stuff that I do here. So I have that going on. And then I have have made a lot of progress in the uh, second realm information system category. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. No, I, I, I definitely feel you there. Um, yeah, once the, the the weather broke this spring, there were uh, we had to uh, – we got the – and I guess that's the first homestead update that uh, I guess if, if you're in the Pasnia Committee of Correspondence or you follow any of the various uh, Twitter accounts, the Pasnia Free Press or, or uh, Willie from Pasnia, um, Willie's uh, the go has a, a Twitter account. But if you're following him, you already know about these, these things. But, um, yeah, we, we, uh, we upgraded the bird shanty um, from the front yard, which is now the main garden, and the plants are just loving, you know, all the chicken fertilizer and stuff. But uh, with the new bird shanty, we had to reinforce it for, uh, for the raccoons. So we lost a bunch of birds. Um, but uh, right now we're incubating a bunch more uh, for the uh, the new duck port. It's a car port that's now. I mean, it looks like. Uh, I mean, it's kind of, we kind of been joke jokingly calling it Bird Knox because it's pretty. Uh, I mean, if you can keep a coon out, it's pretty. Yeah, it's pretty locked down. But uh, they enjoy it in there. They enjoy it. It's a it's a big space. Um, but uh, yeah. Anyway, Jamin, what's what's I guess what's new on the homestead for you? Anything you want to talk about in particular? Um, we we did get our duck and chicken flocks kind of back up to what they were. We did have a lot of predation from raccoons um, a couple years ago, and last year was kind of like building a flock back up. Um, we added quail. Um, I still have the, uh, the Asian heritage hogs in the field. Um, and we, we did uh, the vast majority of the zone one vegetable gardens are all planted mm -hmm. so we have a decent amount of food growing nice. um <clears throat> but beyond that um i've made some progress in some of the uh um permaculture plant guild experimentation um i have a guild now that is 
a uh, sunchoke and a hopness groundnut and clover and it's basically all growing together and the idea is that when it's ready to harvest digging in that air er that general area will harvest both types of tubers and they also balance each other out nutritionally so they could be either eaten by people or fed out to animals or whatever so that that's an interesting one the jerusalem artichoke and you might have to send me that in a message so i can pass it along to aura um, but she planted Jerusalem artichoke specifically. I came across, um, I'm not sure if you've heard of Edward, uh, Ed, Edgar Casey, who was, uh, I guess, a medical, um, I guess, uh, he would he would go into channeled states. And, uh, pe like, he had, he had you know, endless, he, he had endless, um, you, know, uh, you know, I guess, clients. And uh, they would come to him with a medical condition. He would go into a channeled state and pull out the, the so-called cure. And for type 1 diabetes, um, he mentioned uh, sunchokes, Jerusalem artichokes, because apparently there's insulin in there. There's inulin. But he claims that there's there's yeah. more than that too. So like it, it's it was so yeah. I, I had her plant some. I'm gonna experiment with that. But uh, it's just just one of oh, the yeah, avenue. Yeah, it's um, a lot of people have had great success using it for um, diabetes, for sure. Yeah. But yeah, I mean it's it's the th the thing that makes both of these plants significant is that they will spread on their own. And they're not something you have to harvest in a season. So they're kind of like famine gardens. You plant them and you forget about them. And if you ever get to them to need them, they're going to be like exponentially larger than what you planted. Right. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. And I think was, uh, maybe it was you, um, I, I, the, uh, what's the, uh, oh gosh, was it Peter Dale Scott? Um, I think he, he talks about those too. That, yeah, yeah, uh, James, G, yeah, James C. Scott. Okay, yeah, yeah, they they fulfill all the requirements to be an escape crop. Basically. Okay, yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, yeah. What he defines. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so like he had put together this list of requirements. I don't really know them all off the top of my head, but like it was really about fungibility and about kind of being camouflaged and not being economically viable compared to grains for some like core reasons like they were basically crops that these escaped cultures that escaped the state were using to build a uh, like a, a food system off of that was resistant to ever being controlled by the state in the future like um but you know scott goes into great detail in the art of not being governed mm -hmm. about all the uh you know um, characteristics of what you would call an escape crop. Gotcha. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Well, that's I happy to hear all that. Um, I guess uh, anything else you anything else you like to share from uh, from the homestead? No, I mean it's just basically uh, a lot of maintenance and you know finishing up the garden beds now, and um, I'm going to be able to devote some more time to uh, these other projects here. Gotcha. Nice. Nice. Well, I guess the, the only other thing, um, the only other update um, is it's a, a potential legal interstice that I feel like I need to mention. There's nothing like it's all above board. Um, so I figure I'll, I'll go ahead and mention at least here um, as a potentiality for for Benuans. But uh, I guess the setup is that my my uh, my Illinois driver's license expired this year and I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do about it. Um, well, the possibility for a, a valid Mexican driver's license came into came into view. And uh, that actually happened pretty quickly, and um, it's uh, it's pretty wild. Um, it's pretty pretty wild, but it's it's. Uh, I mean, it looks like a pretty pretty solid legal interstice. Um, I mean, yeah. And uh, apparently, I was ta talking to somebody, and apparently, temporary residency. I'm not I'm not even trying to go to Mexico, but like as far as a legal interstice, if I was able to easily get temporary residency, then a temporary residency plus a Mexican driver's license should basically get me clear in the states. Um, for 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 a hundred days, I guess is what they have what, legally speaking per se. But um, I don't know. It's an interesting interesting possibility. Um, <laughs> if uh, if you're if you're in a position like me where you, you don't feel like uh, um, if it's going to be a pain um, for me, I would have had to go see two doctors, and I'm not doing anyth anything else um, for these people anymore. So I just paid it. You know, just just paid the money and got the got the license. So um, <laughs> here we are. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, any, anything on that, Jamin? Oh, yeah. Um, I just heard about it from, from you, you know, when we, we talked earlier. So I'm 
I'm still kind of processing. I mean, it sounds like a pretty good deal to me. Yeah, I'm open. So I'm open. So it was either that or I was going to make a passing a driver's license. So, but that's uh, one of these has more weight than the other. So. Oh, definitely. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you there, there was a magic ritual done on the one you have. Like, it's true. There was, there's state magic dust all over it. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, anyway, um, I guess that's, uh, that's, that's all I have in terms of, uh, in terms of those updates, but, um, yeah, we were talking in terms of, uh, digital liberation. I have to say though, Jamin, uh, we're making, we're making great strides there too. Um, I've talked a lot in recent episodes about the ghost phone, uh, Samurai wallet, which I just interviewed, uh, Samurai wallet on Twitter. Um, the guy who operates that uh, Twitter handle, uh, interviewed that and released that yesterday. If you haven't checked that out, um, your, your ghost pad lineup is increasing. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I uh, I saw the notification for that. I still need to check that out. Yeah, he's a he's a, a cool. Yeah, they're it's a it's an interesting company for sure. Right, it's not even a I mean, I'm just even a way to put it. It's an interesting outfit, interesting dudes. Um, yeah, hard hardcore privacy privacy advocates and builders. So, um, yeah, yeah, um, and then yeah, I mean, like, like I was saying, your your ghost pad lineup is increasing, and, and you're helping me with with the content creation ghost pad too. That was that's that's a new a new prospect. I'm gonna get rid of uh, my my only real hole in my 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 digital security is a content creation laptop. So um, we're gonna we're gonna get that upgraded. I guess just generally speaking for this for this episode, the overall ghost system, uh, this practical set of tools for digital self sovereignty, it's it's all coming together. And uh, I suppose some of it is getting ready for uh, for its second realm debut. Um, and uh, Jam and I was I was thinking about this when I was putting together this really really brief outline um, a few days ago. But um, like I can already see in my head the visual for the information graphic um for the uh for the ghost system um but uh but anyway anyway i guess uh um to to, to start and, and not really have anything planned for how we're gonna how we're gonna go about this um but uh so the the first three components of this we've talked about on here before the ghost pad for research communications uh and the most private personal data uh the ghost phone for maximum mobile autonomy uh the ghost pad freedom box for self-hosted services like secure messaging like the passing committee correspondence uh, private search engine and uh, advanced network-wide ad and tracker filtering. Uh, and then I guess these these uh, additional five or six are ones we haven't really talked about too much. I think they might have come up uh, in passing a little bit. But uh, anyway, I guess what we're what we're what we're talking about here is, um, you know, if you think about it in terms of building the second realm, we're, we're just as we're rebuilding every institution um, of every human institution upon these frameworks of peace and truth, uh, peace and truth, uh, the ghost system will do for basically each need or use case we may have in the digital sphere. Um, which again, always, always, uh, you oftentimes translate, translates into the physical too. So, um, I guess, uh, where, where do we want to start, Jamin? Um, I guess, uh, we've talked, we've talked a lot about the ghost pad, the ghost phone, um, and, uh, the freedom boxes, but I guess we could start with that. Um, since, uh, since we have talked about the freedom box before, uh, you want to give us an update on that. And, uh, I suppose, uh, with the freedom box comes the Pasnia committee correspondence, uh, the XMPP Jitsi server, which, which will be on the freedom box. So, um, yeah, I guess maybe that's, maybe that's a good place to start update on the freedom box. Sure. Sure. Um, the, uh, actual single board computer freedom boxes are still jammed up because of a, uh, problem with Apache, but the committee of correspondence one that's going to be on a virtual private server, um, like that really should just go together without a hitch. Um, basically, I uh, just need to install it on the uh, on the VPS that you got so far. But I mean, there, it's the same. It's the same packages. Like it's basically the same thing that's run on the single board computers. It's just going to be run on the cloud mm -hmm. on a server that you're paying for, so you have some uh, some security to it. <clears throat> um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, if people aren't familiar with XMPP, it's a very mature chat protocol that a lot of like what WhatsApp and, um, I believe it, Yahoo messages and like a, a bunch of other chat programs either still use or used at one time or, and modified it to their own needs for their base protocol for um, communications. So it's an open source protocol. It, and the, the system that uses it doesn't collect metadata unlike everything else, basically. 
Um, you know, end-to-end -end encryption is just one piece of the puzzle for privacy and security. The, the next piece is to not be giving identifiable information outside of the encrypted um, tunnel that they can't look into. So, I mean, basically, that's why it's superior. Um, and it uses, you know, there are multiple client applications for pretty much every platform out there. Um, the encryption that it uses is um, very, very gone over and um, considered good to go by the security community. It's not somebody's own house encryption or um, something that hasn't been tested a lot. So, I mean, it, it's pretty much everything everybody wants and it's made to be, it was made to be decentralized and distributed, just like email and the original, you know, core applications that brought us what the internet is. It was all supposed to be decentralized and distributed and um, not be one, not turned into um, one big conglomerated thing the way mm -hmm. the uh, net is being turned into now. Yeah, and, and I, th I think that's a good point to, to, to mention again. We talked about it in the Pasadena Second Home Assembly, um, and we talked about it privately, but the, the issues with, like, Matrix or even Signal, um, the, uh, the collection of metadata is, uh, is not good. And really, uh, there, there was that video that you shared, I think, in the Signal, Pas in the, speaking of Signal, the, the Signal Pasadena Committee of Correspondence. Um, I don't remember the guy's name, but he did, a, I guess, a walkthrough of XMPP and, and Jitsi, and He's like, yeah, these are these are fads. Like they're they like they they're not good. Um, they're not good for for that reason alone that they collect metadata. And as we talked about in that passing sec realm assembly, it doesn't even matter what's being talked about if they know that all the information about the conversation. They don't need to know what's actually said in there um, to to glean a lot of yeah, information. Yeah, that's from I mean, there. whoever whoever it is, the adversary. Well, whoever it is. Know, see, I think a lot of this really comes down to people not being able to accurately assess their own threat model. Um, you know, it's, and, um, unless you're kind of have, kind of have your finger on the pulse of what's going on in the cybersecurity world, you're not really going to understand the level of threat you have as an individual. Um, people, you know, the conventional wisdom is always that they're not doing anything worth it, that there's no, um, you know, there's not enough incentive to be messed with by the majority of the people that are malicious actors, right? But I mean, that has changed a lot and it's changing even more as the, uh, the geopolitical situation gets worse and worse with all the different factions and, you know, everybody has their own cyber army at this point. And any pe you know, anybody with a computer connected to the internet is a node that can be captured and used for some nefarious purpose. So it doesn't matter that you're not doing anything, that all you do is scroll through cat pics. It, you know, it really doesn't matter. Your device is still a high value target to turn into a bot. Um, and I mean, that's just one level of it. And I'm not really talking about just um, you know, surveillance state and um, alphabet soup and everything like that. Um, there are many, many, many different threat actors out there coming from different sources, from nation state hackers to um, smaller groups that are basically for hire to corporations that are, that do malicious hacking for hire. Um, it's, you know, really like a lot of, you know, another like kind of a common misconception is that because of the advanced capabilities of, you know, the .gov element, that there's really nothing that a normal person can do to um, not be giving them all your data all the time. Like, the, it's like the people have a futility switch. And once you flick that and turn turn that, they basically decide that it's not worth even trying. And a lot of that is from fear and uncertainty and doubt being put out by, you know, various intelligence agencies to 
you know, kind of, uh, um, it's, you know, Wizard of Oz situation where they want their want the public mind to think their capabilities are something that they really aren't. Um, it's a tactic that's used all the time. So there are countermeasures you can take to a lot of the, uh, you know, you know, it's multifaceted, like each facet is a different issue and you can take countermeasures to it. Like one of the biggest things at this point that everybody should worry about is geofencing. And that's what we were talking about before when I was talking about the, uh, you know, people being targeted by their location data and their metadata. And it, you know, it really doesn't matter that whoever is targeting them can't decrypt what they're actually saying. It's they know where they are, they know who they're saying it to. Um, and there are so many other, you know, little variables to be fed into that algorithm. And, you know, you're guilty and too proven innocent with these geofence warrants. I mean, it's happening and it's, um, you know, it's happening in the States. It's not just like in China and stuff. There have been numerous occasions that have like made it to the media, but it happens all the time where people are getting called in for questioning and, um, you know, even even arrested for suspicion of doing things because their phones ratted them out that they were in that general area where that thing happened. So, I mean, it's a much larger problem than what people understand. And like, unless you're considering those things and you're threat modeling, you're, you're going to come up really light on your privacy and security solutions. Yeah. Yeah. Well said, well said. Yeah, and I mean, again, it, it's uh, and and you may not even talk be talking about state agency. There, it might be private coercers, um, someone that might be trying to, you know, if you're one of those, if you're someone that has, you know, Bitcoin on exchange or something, they might be trying to get your get access to your email so they can get access to your your Bitcoin on your exchange. So it might not even be, um, you know, a state adversary, but uh, at the same time, um, you gotta, yeah, take take all those uh, all those precautions. But uh, yeah, um, I mean, if your system is I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead, man. I mean, if your system is zombied by some hacker who is using it as a part of a botnet to distribute something that you're not supposed to have on your system, it's still there. It's on your system. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of ways that people could be severely, you know, swatted type situations with um, the lax state of security and privacy you know, with coming from that um, m misassessment of your vulnerability level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep, exactly. And that's what this ghost system is all about. Um, you know, I think another another obstacle is uh, kind of user friendliness. Like you talk about all of these, everything people have to prepare against, um, or I guess, to, or, or everything, you know, I guess everything, you know, quote unquote, people have to do to take, you know, control over all of their data and, you know, all aspects of their, of their self-liberation. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's that that uh, tr having to learn all of that stuff and put all it together and, and all of that. I think we have a, a good a good possibility, or I guess a, a potential here, um, some sort of a, some sort of a really you know a big bundle, um, or I guess maybe a couple bundles or something like that, um, where people can basically take control of all of their you know um, you know their entire digital and again partially physical realm, um, you know their their, their <coughs> security um, with something like the ghost system. So yeah, I think this is um, this is the direction things need to go. Um, this needs to be, yeah, easy, 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 uh, um, or I guess as easy as they can be. Um, easy, workable. Solution. Oh, definitely. And I mean, I mean, these are just the tools, too. I mean, behaviors need to change and people need to learn how to use the tools with best practices as well. Like, I don't want to claim to be selling any magic bullets. Um, you know, all this stuff requires some due diligence. But it isn't really as difficult as people think once it's all ready set up from out of the box. You know, most of the issues people have are because you basically have to roll these things on your own unless you're buying them from someone like me. So I'm trying to take that barrier of entry out of the equation and offer all the best projects as products in the respective use case niches. So like, for example, um, the ghost pad, 
um, there, that has a specific niche that fits in the network of devices. And if you compartmentalize that type of activity to that, you, you don't you don't have to be a security researcher to have much a much greater chance of not being um, not ha not having your data infiltrated or anything like that, right? Like it's it's basically you know a system that is already set up that um, you just basically need to learn the best use case. Or I'm sorry, the, the uh, best practices to use for the use case of the device. So, one thing that um, you know, people don't just use their laptops for the use case that I market and suggest the ghost pads for. Um, people use their laptops for entertainment, and they use them for content creation and stuff like that. So, basically, I. Um, have been scouring the market to find something that would sit between a fully firmware hardened ghost pad, which can only be a certain um, model range of systems, and it has pretty much a predefined amount of capabilities that I can't extend. So what I found is, and I've been researching this for a while, that the um, Workstation class Dell and HP laptops are perfect candidates because they are so robust and stable and um, upgradable and repairable. So they they basically uh, have a lot of counter economic you know things going for them besides that they are uh, you know they have the Linux OS on them that is security hardened. Um, so basically, these systems, at least the Dell ones so far, um, and the HP ones are going to be in the future because I can actually give those a full firmware replacement, whereas the Dells, all I can do is disable the out-of-band management or the Intel management engine using the method that Intel developed for the NSA's computers. So basically that method is a certain switch that is given in the ROM and once it's turned off in by that switch it theoretically can't be enabled again unless you reflash the system with an enabled management engine so it is uh, not quite as um, it's not quite as taken care of as on the ghost pads where depending on the generation it's either completely removed or the actual software that's required to initialize it and make it work is removed. Um, so these basically still have a functioning management engine but it's turned off using it's basically the technology that the NSA requested Intel to develop. So these Dell systems are one of the few manufacturers that offered that on their high-end business systems. And um, on the surplus market, um, they pop up from time to time. So I've been collecting them and using them to build content creation and gaming systems that you can basically offload all those tasks that the Ghostpad isn't either suited for or it would actually be counterintuitive and counterproductive for its privacy and security. Like, you know, um, online gaming is a huge attack vector. Um, people are hacked through games all the time. It's not something you want to run on a system that is compartmentalized for privacy. Um, you, know, you know, when I talk about online gaming, I'm talking about using a launcher like Steam or or whatever that's also running in the background and collecting metadata on your gaming and you know it's just not something you want to run on for the use case that the ghost pad is for so all that stuff can be easily compartmentalized onto these dell workstations and they are a beast of a system um, they accept up to four internal storage devices they have upgradable gpus that are 
basically um, they top out at fairly modern processors or you know, GPUs. So they can pretty much play any game on Steam with the higher end one at uh, 1080p with you know medium or so graphic settings. So I mean they're respectable in that regard. And um, they have a you know consumer orientated Linux version on them. They have Zubuntu, which is a kind of a thin thin down version of Ubuntu with a more efficient interface. Um, and the reasoning behind that is that there is the most there is the most um, self help information out there on the Ubuntu distributions. And the chances of a user being able to find an answer to their question that is specific to the version of Ubuntu that it's based off of is very high. So even though I do believe there are better Linux distributions in general, um, this is a fine distribution for this use case. Nice. Um, and it also enables me to you know, easily install the proprietary graphics drivers for the NVIDIA GPUs and have them be updated automatically. Um, there's just a lot of things Ubuntu makes you easy under the hood to use as a base. Um, another thing that it makes easy is um, quickly hand rolling a content creation system. They have what's called Ubuntu Studio. And Ubuntu Studio is this massive set of meta packages that turns any system that you install the whole thing onto into a production audio, video, graphics, CAD, CAM system. Mm. It puts, you know, if you install the whole thing, it installs the whole thing. Like pretty much anything you want to do to a graphics file or audio or video, like it already has the apps on it to do it. They're already, you know, they're waiting in your menu to open them. Stuff like um, Open Broadcast Studio, um, GIMP, um, Inkscape, Krita, um, uh, Blender, um, KDM Live, video, you know, so basically um, hard disk recorders, multi trackers, software synthesizers, you know, it turns the system into everything open source has to offer. Amazing. So that's another point to these systems is to you know, they're kind of, you know, the industry says they systems like this don't exist, that you can't just sit in front of a Linux system that you buy and use it like it's some um, Mac or Windows system and have everything work and be able to sit and actually be productive with it. Like the, the FUD on that is always been that it's, you know, so difficult to set up and like, it's so hard to learn, and and the uh, the alternatives that it offers are so far behind that they they're unusable. And you know, when people start sitting in front of these things and they start doing what they're trying to do, because that's what a you know creating, being creative and using a tool is. Can you do what you want to do with it? Mm -hmm. They'll find that they can pretty much do whatever they need to do, and if they're honest about them about the actual trade-offs they make to have it be more familiar um i don't i don't really think the the alternatives to free and open source hold any water because you're getting you're giving up a lot of autonomy you know, on so many levels to have that um slight ease of use or familiarity that, but, yeah, you know true. advantage yeah, that's that's true. That's definitely true, and that's that's where I'm at. Um, is that uh, I know like with the the ghost phone, I guess there's been time too. So I know this stuff's advanced. Um, it's advanced um, quite quite a ways as you as you've just been been uh, outlining. The, one of the important things with what the ghost kind of brand means, and one of the core tenets of any device that I add ghost to. You know, that basically means the device is not able to be out of band managed. That means that someone using out of band management software can't hijack your system through the, 
any type of management interface to do malicious things. Um, now, the ghost phones, as soon as you get on a network and as soon as you enable that modem, there is management technology built into that and there is no way around that if you want access to the mobile network. But as far as all the other devices, with the laptops, the single board computers, the routers, you know, and everything that is built on top of the single board computers, mm -hmm. um, those all are completely lacking of any type of remote management, remote out of band management interface software that can affect them. So there is an entire category of like God level own your system attacks that these systems just don't respond to at all. <laughs> so that's what's about. Them. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's definitely time. It's definitely time. Um and uh and even though like uh um, I'm thankful that this this laptop's lasted this long. It's just 2013. It's a stupid Windows machine, but um, I can only imagine. Um, like I, I've I've noticed all the advantages from switching over to the Ghost Phone after you know just after getting used to it for a little while. I think it'll be a little more to get used to um, with the content creation laptop. But at the same time, I mean, the uh, the fact like it, this, that laptop's going to be so much faster than this piece of shit I've been using for for so long. Like I already know that um, the Ghost Pad that the, the first Ghost Pad I have of yours is still faster than this one. So um, I'm I'm pretty sure that's that's going to be the case. And yeah, after I get used to it, it's gonna it's gonna be a thousand times better. Um, just got to do it. Just got to do a little work with with bearing with the inconvenience. Um, and it's is uh, it's far worthwhile. The open source and owning your shit um, and not having a bunch of bloatware to turn on right when you turn on the machine um i can i can only imagine it's probably probably pretty incredible i'll find out here soon well i mean that's you know kind of the rhetoric that i have a hard time coming up with because of you know the free software movement is you know freeze and freedom um it really focuses on um free and even you know the designation freeze and freedom it's it doesn't really get the autonomy aspect into uh you know consciousness of a lot of people who listen to the rhetoric and you know on the core of everything this is you know this is what it's all about it's about individual autonomy it's you know it's not like a coke versus pepsi argument where like i'm saying linux is better and this is better because i have ego invested in it and this is the way i like to do things and it's like I'm, I'm saying people should do this because these are the only options that are actually countermeasures. And if you want to have any impact at all counter economically against this growing technological dystopia, then you have to use your market pressure and support the, the systems that are trying to be built that could be used in place of that. Like, mm -hmm. um, you know, that is really the, the core of it all is that it's all about autonomy. Um, these systems you actually own, you own the software, you own the hardware, you are the arbiter of who does what with it. Um, that can't be said for anything you buy on Amazon or Best Buy or directly from Dell or whatever, right? Like there are many, many elements to that that you don't have the autonomy over, you don't have the control over. I mean, you can't just go buy a de-Googled smartphone. Like the industry refuses to really make that a thing on a mass scale. There are lots of people like me, I'm far from the only person selling de-Googled phones. Um, yeah, there one. are many, many people. Yeah. Um, but, you know, even with all the popularity, even with all the people doing it, there really isn't like a company that is putting out flagship phones that are putting out new devices that is giving anybody any of these options. Like all these products are products that the basically that the industry refuses to make and they refuse to make them this way because this way empowers the users 
over their products and not the products over the users. And I mean, that's as clear as I can break it down. Like these products are empowered to be used against you unless you can actually own them and owning them meaning in a, in the sense of being the exclusive um, entity that controls the device. Like it doesn't mean that you have it in your pocket. It doesn't mean that you're the one that paid the bill. It means that you control what goes on on it. Um, and for the most part, a lot of this is opt in, you know, people click the user agreement and do the thing, but the industry has kept these alternatives away from people. So they think it's futile to resist it. So they don't, you know, understand the alternatives existing. And really the people providing the alternatives are not good at marketing. That's not what they do. That's not what I do. You know, like I'm completely lost in trying to explain, you know, I'm pretty much all logic and, um, you know, what works. Yeah. I'm not real. you know, it's hard for me to soften it to, you know, why people should care if they don't already, you know, like I've cared for a very long time. Like, it's funny. I look through some like old documents and stuff and, you know, I was into the EFF in like 2000. So, you know, this has been an, all my adult life, I've been trying to raise, raise awareness and I forecasted pretty much everything that has gone on so far. Yeah. And a lot of the stuff I said that was going to go on in the future is already going on, just not here. So um, I'm just doing what I can to kind of uh, stem the tide of all that. Yeah, yeah, and uh, said it. You know, not necessarily here yet for all of those things, but it's soon enough. Um, it's time to start implement, implementing these things. Um, but uh, so we, we, it's we, a matter of kind and degree. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's only, yeah, only it's a matter of kind and degree, man. Yeah. Um, so um, I guess uh, so. We talked about the ghost pads and the ghost station, which um, you know, the ghost pads more of the the secured personal personal you know computer. Um, the ghost station more for gaming and content creation. Uh, the ghost phone for maximum mobile autonomy. Uh, then the freedom box uh, for the self-hosted services. I guess the other one, kind of in this in this data digital sort of. I guess the couple other ones that we should talk about. I guess uh, anything, any details you'd like to mention about them, um, like the ghost router to secure your network from outside threats, and then pr uh, maybe the uh, the NAS uh, to store and serve media. Maybe we can talk about those uh, for a little bit here. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, there is kind of this temptation to put a lot of these services on one device. And you can totally get a single board computer that's beefy enough to run all the services I'm talking about for this ideal network I'm building. Um, but that has a lot of issues with security because it's all on one device. It's one single point of failure. So, um, and you know, this is, you know, all gambling on the cost of single board computers will come down again, and I won't have to pay three times as much as my original planning allotted for and all this. But these individual ghost devices are doing a small amount of high value, um, or, you know, offering a small amount of high value services each, and they have total compartmentalization and they're immune to any of the management level attacks. So, you know, versus using just like a random, maybe old desktop PC running all this stuff, you know, that has a management engine and, you know, we go through that whole rabbit hole again. <laughs> so, you know, all these devices are clean. You know, they're clean. They have exactly what they need on them to do their job. There's, they are, you know, full Linux installations that, one could customize to do whatever because they own them once they buy them, but their intended use case is to do what they were sold to do for compartmentalization purposes. So the ghost router is an off the shelf router that is a specific model that works very well with a open source router distribution of Linux that is um, called OpenWRT. So they've had their firmware replaced 
with a completely free and open source, heavily audited router firmware for routers that is all based on the same technology that the ghost boxes run on their single board computers. It's just a distribution for routers that is thinned down and only the essentials run on it, but it can do a lot more than the routers did out of the box. And it also basically, it cleans them from anything that could be hiding in the manufacturer's firmware because that is a thing that is common and that doesn't always even come from the manufacturer in fact um if you look into um router firmware hacking and you know intercepting you know the nsa was intercepting shipments of them and modifying the firmware and then sending them back out to their destinations still happening getting worse um they're not the only ones that do it because, you know, if you own someone's router, you own their internet connection. And you yeah. probably can own all the devices behind it, too. Um, that is, so this is, you know, this is, that's this the is a really, This is a really it's important router. one. Yeah, it's a really important one, is the point. Yeah. So what makes them special is that they are just basically free and open source firmware with nothing hiding in there that the community can find through all the searching for stuff to find. Um and their, you know, current versions that are updated, and um, they're basically the the industry standard for people doing this. Like all these devices I'm doing, I'm putting you know my own branding and everything on them. But I want to stress that they are projects that I found and I rolled into products. Like that is the nature of open source. The anybody can do this. Um, the key is that. Uh, you know, even this network could be used as a starting point for someone to build their own version of it. Everything's freely available for them to do that. There's, right. a, there's a lot of uh, digital snake oil out there and a lot of people selling free and open source projects that they've done very minor modifications to as something new, special, and um, better than everything else. And they are, it's snake oil. So, you know, this, I'm very anti-snake oil in all this. Like, I'm not making any any claims that isn't that aren't backed up by, you know, troves of security research and data. Um, and I'm using all industry standards. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing new and special that my team has come up with. This, you know, that's what these projects have been doing for decades. And it's, um, a lot of them, it's really it's you know prime time for them to get some to get some more users because they've been going at it for a very long time. I've been running DDWRT on my home router since about two thousand two. Jesus, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, yeah, and I mean, these are kind of like underground industry standards that the industry just really isn't a fan of, <laughs> you know. Um, so, I mean, that's what the ghost router is. It's a high quality um, gigabit ethernet ports. Um, I forget the exact uh, wireless speed, but it's a, um, oh, it's an Archer C7 is the model that I ended up using because it's the one that is real popular for other people doing this. Mm. So it gets a lot of, uh, a lot of shakedowns and a lot of support. Um, but it's no different than anybody else's DDWRT router. Um, it's just, I did it. <laughs> yeah. I put it on there. Um, so I, I think that's that's, so, that's another that's another selling point too. So I guess the and it's selling point. Um, what we're kind of doing, and, and you're right about this. I've noticed noticed with the open source projects, like there's incredible fucking projects out there, but no one knows about them. So like what we well like what you're doing with the ghost system, what I'm trying to do, what I I, I kind of see, or maybe hopefully this, or maybe this is what you're trying to do or not, but it's a way to market and make these like it's a way to market and make and actually get these things into people's hands, um, whether they whether they build them exactly. themselves or whether they go with um, these systems. It's a way to think about it. So just as much education as it is trying to um, you know get people to actually get these in their hands. Um, and obvi and honestly, Jamin, um, maybe like for the hardcore folks, like. Maybe I'd maybe I'd just recommend them go ahead and do it themselves. They might enjoy it, and and, and maybe maybe they're better suited for that. But yeah, for a lot of sure. folks, for a lot of folks, um, for me, like the ghost phone, I didn't want to. I didn't want to. Um, I've heard it's not that hard to you know flash a flash a pixel with, um, 
you know, with Calyx or whatever, but I haven't done it. Um, I just have that to you. So um, I'm one of those folks, um, but there's there's plenty of folks along the, along the spectrum. So um, anyway, um, so the Ghost Router, that's a, a critically important one. Uh, what about uh, the Ghost Vault uh, Network Attached Storage uh, to store and serve media? Tell us uh, what we got going on there. Okay, the Ghost Vault is a... Right now, they're based on Rock 64 single board computers. Um, that could change with single board computer availability and the software that I'm using. Um, the operating system is Armbian, which is like Debian for ARM based computers. So it doesn't really matter so much what the hardware is, but um, because of the chip shortages and whatnot. And, you know, some perspective on the chip shortages. Like, most of the single board development computers, you know, single board computers for development purposes like the Raspberry Pi and the Rock 64 series and the Banana Pi, and like I could go on and on and on because there's so many of them. They use chips that are closer to the trailing edge or the tailing edge of the industrial process, like the older fabrication technology. And that is what has been hit the hardest with all the shortages and everything, because that's that sector of the microchip industry was already um, underrepresented by you know fabrication fabs fab, um, fabrication plants and attention put on it because everybody is always focused on the newest, um, basically the newest process that's pumping out the latest you know Nvidia and AMD GPUs and CPUs and stuff like that. So a lot of these older, more obsolete for those purposes, but still perfectly functional for things like automotive industry, um, you know, embedded microcontrollers, like the stuff that it doesn't matter if it can play Doom or not, right? Like, you know, all that stuff is um, in really short supply and the manufacturing of it is like years out. And that's just from the COVID lockdowns and everything else, not even accounting for um, the various shortages of pieces of that whole um, industrial system from the Ukraine situation. Um, and like, I believe it's argon gas is one of the, uh, you know, materials they're having a shortage of and the fabrication process uses it. Like there's, you know, it's so multifaceted, right? So, I have a very finite supply of these Rock 64s that I bought before all this stuff got as bad as it did because I saw it happening. And I invested as heavily as I could with the supplies that were available. And I'm only talking maybe 50 boards, right? Like, but once they're gone, I don't, you know, that's pretty much it. Right. Like, unless I want to pay the replacement costs that I have to sell them for, for them, like, it's going to be a significant like these systems aren't going to hit the price points that I was trying to begin with. Like, I don't want this to be priced out of, like, I want people to actually buy them, like people that need them to buy them. And I, you know, like you can easily pay $400 for a Google pixel three a and the same condition I, I sell them for mm -hmm. and, and sell them in like easily. And it's, it's really the same with all these devices. Um, and a lot of these companies that were had stuff, you know, most of the products were based on some, you know, iteration of the Raspberry Pi. Well, the Raspberry Pi is very, very scarce and um, going for three and four times what the MSRP is for them. You know, and you when you can find them, you can buy one at a time. And like, you know, the, the bottom has completely dropped out of kind of the DIY out of development board market so um you know i, I guess that's a, a long way of saying that, that the hardware platform is kind of you know it's going to be whatever i find to replace the rock 64 that does the same things as well and still doesn't have out of band management and all the all the stuff because rock 64 it's not perfect and there's you know it's a development platform right but it is fairly free of any of that, um, any binary blobs or anything like that. And like the boards themselves, the PCB is open source and it has a lot of things going for it. That's why I chose it even over the Raspberry Pi 
because the Pi needs binary firmware blobs in order to use the Wi-Fi and some of the other things on the device, right? Like these are cleaner than a Pi when you're looking at it as far as what's going to wrap me out that I can't audit on this thing. So that's why I use them. And I'll be looking for something to replace them with. But, um, you know, it's it's all going to be, if, you know, these little chip companies, you know, these little manufacturers that are making these development boards can, you know, get their silicone in in the mail, you know. But Right. right. And also, and so, also okay. so, 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 so you know, to be clear, um, just for, for the benefit of the audience, um, so we're talking about like things that would like the things that need the Raspberry Pi or the Rock 64s. Um, those are going to be, you know, probably pre pretty limited supply until you find a replacement. If you can find a replacement, that's still still an if. But things like the ghost pads, um, the yeah. ghost phones, um, probably even the ghost state, well, maybe the ghost stations too, potentially. Um, those you should have for people going forward. Um, it's just these other ones. Once they're there, once the once this once they're gone, they're gone. So it's kind of what you're getting at. Yeah, and I mean, I'm actively looking for something to replace them with. Um, you know, from the gate, I've had multiple models for this contingency, but the bottom dropping out of the entire market made those models disappear as well. Like, I was fairly, I, I planned really good, <laughs> but you know, you know, that's the way she goes, boys. Um, <laughs> channeling Ray from the Trailer Park Boys there. Yep. Um, but yeah, man, like, so, you know, the devices I have built off of those are all the box devices, like the ghost box devices. Um, and one that's really cool that I just came up with is a, uh, it's called the ghost box Sentinel. And what it basically is, is it is, it monitors your, your local network and your wireless network for any new devices that pop up on it. And you can either check its web interface. It has just a simple, you hook, you know, connect to it like a web page to configure it and to monitor it, or it can send you an email. Like there's, you know, there's options. And as functionality gets added to it, it's open source. You know, there's probably going to be other types of notifications that one can do. Right now it does email. But what, what else it does is it has a package on it called PyHole. And what PyHole is, is it's basically a <laughs> active denial system to ads and trackers. And it works on the domain name system level, the DNS level. And it basically substitutes for the DNS on your network instead of you going out to the internet directly. And it just straight up blocks known malicious sites um, I mean, you can, it's very configurable. Like you can put it in like an equivalent to a paranoid mode and it's, it would, you know, even make usage hard at the, at the end point just yeah. because it's blocking everything. Um, but basically it's tunable and configurable and it has very same default settings that will basically protect your entire network from any of those machines even trying to connect to it. So it does that, and it also is set up to use an encrypted DNS because, you know, really what a lot of people are trying to accomplish with VPNs, you can basically just accomplish with an encrypted DNS, and you're not adding another party in between you and whatever it is you're trying to do on that, mm -hmm. on that service, right? Um, you know, the, you, you know, when you're using a VPN, you're just moving your point of trust forward one, right? Um, and there's a lot of good reasons to do that. But if you're just trying to hide your browsing activity, which you should from the ISP, if you're using an encrypted DNS, it doesn't know what site you're looking up. It doesn't, you know, it, um, you know, basically it, it can't log any of your DNS requests. You know, the DNS requests go to an encrypted DNS server, and that eliminates so much of the spying capability of where you're going on the internet by the ISP without a VPN or Tor or anything. Just that simple thing that can be done at the router level. Um, and of course, the ghost router can be set up to use the encrypted DNS by itself. But once you add Pi Hole to the mix, 
where you're actually blocking malicious DNS requests and you're not letting these, you know, networks that are known ad networks. And I mean, you know, targeting someone for advertising and targeting someone for physical harassment is the same freaking algorithm, man. Like, you know, it's denying them all this. That's what crypto anarchism is, right? It's denying them enough information on you to put you in their sites for targeting. It's, yep. So it's like, you know, so the pie hole system and, um, you know, pie hole, you know, I've been wanting to include that on the freedom boxes because you can, it's not an easy one click install from the freedom box menu. It's like you can zip tie and duct tape it in there, <laughs> but it has, it already has a um, privacy proxy on it called Privoxy. So they can basically be used in tandem. And so does the ghost router. The ghost router actually will do Privoxy as well. So like you wouldn't even need the freedom box. You could be doing Privoxy on the router, but that's another, that's another configuration story. Yeah. Um, but um, Privoxy basically is a proxy that eliminates ads and trackers in a different way. Um, so, you know, all these, you know, um, kind of all, all this stuff is opt in if you, um, don't take the countermeasures, right? And these are all the countermeasures and it's significant. If you start doing them all, you really do start to become a hard target for surveillance or harassment. Yes, ex exactly, exactly. So two things come to mind. First off, the ghost box and the ghost routers seem like just kind of like fundamental root solutions to a lot of, uh, you know, connection, um, or I guess a lot of uh, security risks. And, uh, um, yeah, I forgot what the other And one. so the, the yeah, open media, yeah, the, the open media vault, um, that is basically a, you know, a, um, storage server it's your own personal you know cloud server on your own personal network and it's compartmentalized away from everything else it's its own thing it runs you know a um it, it's basically linux it's based off of rmb and linux like the other ghost boxes it has the linux firewall it has all the security advantages of linux but it is just basically for holding and sharing your files on your local network. Um, it's low power. So instead of like maybe having, you know, I know for myself for the longest time, I've always had one of my desktops designated to be on all the time. And I would just, you know, fill it full of hard drives and that's where my media would go. Um, mm -hmm. But that opens it up, opens all my media up to, to, um, any app that's running on there. I mean, there's, yes, there's levels of compartmentalization, the operating system, everything like that. But, you know, that's what zero days are for, you know? So basically compartmentalizing that stuff off of a system that does anything but hold and share those files um, makes it that much harder for your home personal files to, and I, you know, I use mine for media storage. I put my, my digital library on it. I put um, my movies and TV shows and downloaded downloaded streaming videos and all that stuff, right? It's my media server. Mm -hmm. um, and I also use it to back up my, uh, a lot of my business documents and just having an, a, a, you know, a single point on your network that you can dump your files that is not spooky at all and no one else controls it and it's on your own, you know, it's on your local network. It's not accessible by, you know, by the, you know, your internet side. Um, it just really rounds out the network and it enables you to, um, to not have as much client side storage as well, because, you know, one thing that works with it, is like the ghost stream boxes, which are simply um, a bare bones Linux install um, called um, Libra Elec. That is based, it, uh, the tagline is just enough Linux to run Kodi. <laughs> That's all it is. It, it's enough Linux to run Kodi and do networking and 
that type of stuff. It has nothing else on there that can be compromised or anything like that. It just runs Kodi. And Kodi, for those who aren't familiar, is a really full-featured media entertainment platform for streaming, um, you know, web streaming, um, local media. Um, it, it's basically all you need. It's, you know, a smart TV replacement is the best way you could describe them, or a Chromecast replacement. But it's 100% free and open source. And um, there are actually a lot of plugins and mods that can be done to it for streaming content for free for a lot of services. But that's, you know, that's just to search away for everybody. Okay. Um, yeah, like it is. And a lot of those plugins will, you know, they can download the, the stream as the tor torrent file or, you know, there's all sorts of different um, agorist opportunities with Cody, but that it's, you know, on the surface, it is just probably one of the best media players you can get. Um, and so these devices are, that's all they do. They run Cody. They you use them instead of the device integrated in your smart TV or a Chromecast or a Roku or whatever, and you own it. There's nothing anybody is going to do without your knowledge unless they come up, come across some zero day in Cody or Linux. Like it's, there's nothing extra. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why, you know, it's just a clean system to watch your videos on. Right. Um, and right now those, I mean, I'm selling those for 75 bucks. And that's the good. So they're not even system? that expensive. Yep. Okay. They are super simple for me to make. I image an SD card and let it do its thing and, make sure it works and I have a, I have two to ship out to our friend on the Pasnia chat there in the bag. Uh -huh. It's in the bag. Very nice. But yeah, they're working out pretty good. And then, you know, and along with that, a simple SD card changes it into a game emulation system too. Um, and I can have those available. It's called Laka. It emulates like all the console systems. And right now, um, you can basically get all the games for those just by going on to um, archive.org. And now they're basically all on there to download for free. So you could literally, you know, my system has, I want to say, 6,000 console ROMs on it. <laughs> and it's, it's a little, you know little freedom box size, you know, size of a pack of cigarettes or whatever. Um, so, I mean, they're, the system are modular, right? But, you know, the, um, the ghost stream does streaming. And I actually have made systems that do both the emulation and the streaming and future versions of Kodi will have that working better because it does work in Kodi, but it's like, working in Kodi and getting it to work in Kodi are sometimes two different things if you're familiar with using software that is in development. But like all the basic stuff, watching movie, you know, watching videos, file, local files, network files, streaming, plugins, all that stuff works. Um, nice. And you, you know, with these systems, everybody just has to look forward to the advancements in the applications because they keep getting better. And like, you know, even going back to the, the ghost station, the ghost station um, is built with gaming in mind and it has what it's called Lutrius. And Lutrius is this, it's this, um, it does a lot of things, right? It is kind of a game launcher, but at the same time, it is this repository of install scripts to install pretty much any game that works in Linux via one or two clicks without having to go through any of the hoops one has to jump through to get some of the games to run. So basically, you look up the game you want to run on their database and you click on it. Now, you have to purchase it if it's from some content delivery place like Steam or Epic or whatever, but 
it does all the stuff for you to install it, installs it on your system, including all the emulators. So pretty much any console game that you've ever thought of that you might want to play or arcade game that you saw when you were a kid, you can find, and there's an install script that you click on. And when I say script, it's a, it's a link on a web page, right? It's, I'm not talking about the command line here. And it goes out and downloads and installs it. And then you have that game. So it's actually easier than any platform out there if you know what, what, um, you know, what applications to use to make your life easy. So, and it's, it basically integrates with Steam and the other content delivery platforms so that you can basically use it as your main launcher to launch all your games through all the different services. So that's installed and set up from the gate as well as Steam on these systems. And I'm not endorsing Steam because they are proprietary, um, but you have to give Valve the kind of credit where it's due, and they are the ones that have spearheaded Linux gaming and bringing this platform, Linux as a gaming platform, to the masses and making it an option. So even though I don't trust them as far as I can throw them, so to speak, um, like they have done that. Like that is a thing. Like early on, you know, I played the original Half-Life games under Wine because of their development and helping the Wine devs play, you know, get the Half-Life games to work. Like they've been at it from the gate of Linux being um, game capable. So... Mm -hmm. Um, but that's not my, that's not an endorsement of their, you know, all seeing eye that's running in the background when you're playing your games that you can't really do without to, you know, to play on their, to play any of the games you buy from there. But the thing is, they are the ones that have been spearheading the Linux game development and they have a Linux game system on the market now. So between them and Google with Google's um, game delivery system they call Stadia, basically every developer out there now has a massive amount of incentive to at least make their games compatible with the Linux compatibility layers that you can use to run Windows games on Linux. Um, pretty much the entire server side of Google's gaming infrastructure is Linux based. Google is running all those games that it delivers to people on Linux servers using the same technology that Lutrius and, and Steam uses under the hood to run the Windows games on your local computer. So, I mean, it's to the point now where the only games that really don't work are games that the developers refuse to make work by deliberately sabotaging it so you can't join one of their servers if you're running it on Linux through um, anti quote unquote anti cheat software, which is some really malicious spyware that actually has access to very low levels of your system to make sure that you don't have, um, you know, you know, the reason they say is to make sure you don't have like modified system files and you're somehow cheating with them. Oh, but yeah. I mean, the anti-cheat software on Windows, they, you know, they, they scour your Windows um, libraries and stuff like it has full access to all of that. Like it's spooky. So, you know, and when you're running one of those games on Linux, you're running in a Windows, you're not running in, you know, you're running in a virtual Windows environment that's a translation layer and that's a layer of abstraction between that game and the rest of your system. So, you know, you know, I can't, <clears throat> you know, ideally everybody would not have to worry about this stuff, but if you're someone who likes to play games and likes to do any type of gaming at all, then um, it makes sense that 
you're at least taking some type of countermeasures to not let that activity sabotage everything else you're doing because it is a huge um, attack surface. I mean, the online code of those games is all, you know, there are severe security issues being found all the time. That's why they're updated so often. Um, and, you know, the launchers and the anti-cheat, you know, all that has so much, so much access low level on your system that it makes a lot of sense to try to run it on a system that isn't as easy to, uh, um, it, you know, it's not as easy to roll over the compartmentalization in Linux than it is on Windows. Like you can escalate privileges in Windows much easier to, okay, all, all of a sudden I'm the administrator, right? Like, hell, like Windows, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of like, performance mods that people suggest that you run the games as administrator and stuff like i mean a lot of a lot of people are doing that so it's like they has full access to your system just like you do if you're running it on that level right mm -hmm. yeah so i i mean I, I know i'm getting getting ranty here but um i mean that's really the, the the purpose for it all right yeah yeah, so I guess um, there's one other element, um, or I guess one other, one other aspect of the ghost system that we haven't covered yet, but I wanted to make a couple of comments. First one is that it's an observation that I continue to, uh, that I've, I've had using it more, as well as your, is kind, of, kind of what you're talking about. Um, but free and open source is, it's becoming easier than proprietary, um, than the proprietary stuff out there now. Um, and I think it's because they want so much control that it makes it impossible to use if you aren't doing just like the basic bullshit on it. Um, like I, I was, I was, I felt my dad with his tablet a number of times, and it's like, oh my god, like it's they've locked it down, like it's like it's to a child's level, um, like they don't even give you the menu anymore. It's yeah. just like it's just like a um, a condensed home menu. You can't even access anything else. It's crazy. Um, they lock them down so much. So that's the the first observation is that like, um, like uh, yeah, you need to do these things, but then also like if you want to be efficient in in this day and age, like you got to use free and open source software, not like this bogged down bloatware ridden. Um, you know, surveillance, spyware, nonsense like Windows or whatever. Um, and then the other, the other thing is we're we're going through a lot of these. Um, and there was something you brought up earlier. Um, uh, so like a crypto venue and bundle or some bun some some name of a bundle, um, with a ghost pad, a ghost phone, and a Faraday bag for a phone. I think it'd be a terrific start. Um, um, if we do get get that put together and released, then that'd be a terrific start. Um, because I don't want people to get overwhelmed with thinking about like, oh, I've got to add like six elements to this. Um, I'd say just start with that. Like if you start with yeah. like, a ghost pad and a ghost phone. Um, like that's a that's a hell of a start right there, and you can you can just just as with building a liberated lifestyle, it doesn't all have to be done overnight or within like a week. Like you can you know do build these things one at a time, uh, as your competency and, and time allows. Yeah. So yeah. And, and like you know the router can be added a la carte, or I mean that is definitely an area that can be researched, and there are a lot of routers that are compatible with the open source alternatives. Like you know one of my kind of geeky hobbies is I collect routers from Goodwill and flash them with open source firmware. I made like, I've gotten boxes of old routers um, that were just being thrown out and I've made a wireless mesh network here out of them. Like Jeez. there's, uh, you know, a lot of different models out there that work. I'm like, I'm focusing on this one because it's available. It works well. It's popular for this use case. And, um, it's relatively inexpensive. I mean, hundred bucks, mm -hmm. hundred twenty-five, depending on availability and um, stuff like that. But this first lot, I, th I think this first lot I can sell for a hundred. I think. I have to keep looking. Yeah, I gotta make a spreadsheet. <laughs> no, I get it. It's, it. It gets hard to get. It gets hard to keep track of. I can. I can only imagine. Um, so I guess this last this last item that we haven't covered yet, and I think we might have covered it a little bit um, last time we had you on a little while back, but um, the ghost eye surveillance and security system. Um, yeah, tell us tell us uh, about about that one. All right. Well, that one is definitely based off of Raspberry Pi. Um, that is using a project called Motion iOS, and I haven't tried to get a Rock sixty four configured that way. And one thing that the Pi has over the Rock 64 for the use case is that it has a um, I believe it's CSI camera interface. There's like a direct interface for a camera. 
Um, otherwise, you'd have to use a USB camera or cameras. But the you know the Pi has that going for it that it has that camera inter interface, and so does the Pi Zero, which is like the you know really less expensive, lower powered version. Um, so it's basically a Raspberry Pi four or three, depending on variables and supply. They both do the job well. And it can have USB cameras, and eventually it will have a um, integrated camera solution. But it's just, it runs this um, really mature um, open source surveillance software called Motion. And it basically can be configured to broadcast video, pictures, um, you can use audio with it, um, and it is a security system that you actually control and own. There's, it's not like some sketchy Harbor Freight Chinese contractor riddled with zero days and backdoors um, right. <laughs> type of thing. It is a, it's a Raspberry Pi with Ras Raspbian OS on it, or Raspberry Pi OS, whatever they're calling it today. Um, with the package um, Motion iOS installed on top of it. So um, it's just basically a surveillance device that's that you are in control of and won't rat you out easily. The ghost eye. I mean, all this Security stuff, system of the second yeah. realm. I like it. <laughs> I can definitely see it. And there's all kinds of things that can be done with it. Um, like, there are a lot of features that can be added in everything. But on a general level, it's to, you know, even if you weren't using it for camera input, you it's a motion detector, right? Like, um, you know, there, you know, it wouldn't be an, an insane idea to have a security system if you don't want yourself to be on camera all the time to not actually be recording, but just be to um, keeping track of what's changing in the picture, right? Of the motion. Sure. I mean, a lot of times with security systems, that's really what we're alerting to anyway is like, okay, we had an event and then you can actually view it or whatever. But I mean, there's all kinds of options. You can have it stream, you can have it back up to your ghost, um, ghost vault, you know, and it, and it all works together and it keeps all that stuff in its own compartmentalized hamster wheel too. So it's not, you're not running surveillance software on your computer, right? Like right. you're running surveillance software in the box that you unplug if you want the surveillance to go away. You know, like um, if that is a better explanation of, yeah. of why to compartmentalize it, right? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I, I'm definitely getting a, a big, a better, a better picture of how all these things are, uh, are going to come together for, yeah, this, this, this uh, really, uh, really incredible, uh, incredible practical, um, you know, set of tools for digital and uh, physical self-sovereignty. So um, I'm loving it so far, man. I guess the, the burning question then, um, obviously the ghost phones, the ghost pads, uh, the ghost stations, I presume, um, those are um, those are ready to go. You said the entertainment systems are ready to go. Um, what's the what's the time frame look like on um, and obviously it's always a burning question, right? So that's time frame on some of these other things like the ghost box uh, Sentinel network or the ghost box Sentinel the uh, the network attached storage um, the router, etc Well the um, the Sentinel I could actually be selling now um, I, I want to make a couple more to uh, just be sure of repeatability because that's something I've learned so far. Just because one works doesn't mean the next one will sometimes. And that's always fun. But um, there's no reason why it shouldn't. Um, so, yeah, the, you know, they're available. And, you know, all of these are, you know, if you buy the first run, you're you're going to be testing by the nature of, the, of your use case because I can only test as much as I can test here. Like I have a certain use case I can test it for. I can see if it works um, on my network and everything like that. But uh, there's a million ways they can be configured. Like there, 
they're a full full featured Linux box. So it's uh like you can add features and all sorts of stuff to them. So um, yeah, like yeah, they're they're available. Okay. Um, the the ghost stations have, have been what I put the most effort into recently. Um, and that's after realizing the Dells were a better fit than the HPs because I was evaluating HPs for quite a long time and had a, a bunch of prototypes built off of them because they have the promise of working with the whole full firmware replacement at some point because they technically do. I've bricked everyone I've tried, but they technically work. So mm. we're, we're close. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's, back you know when my when my spiral of things to do goes back to figuring out why i'm bricking them and they're not working they will they'll be available as full firmware replacement ones but you know for now the dells the dells are probably better machines as much as i've liked the hps because i've had them for a while um for the gaming use case because they have an additional hdmi out on them and they actually have a more robust cooling solution. So I can max them out to the gills as far as processor and GPU. So, um, yeah, I, I'm really liking the, the Dells. Like, they're, like, I'm pretty much replacing all my systems here with them. So I won't have any out-of-band management vulnerability here at all. Because I still have a couple desktops that I run. So, well, that's that's awesome to hear, man. I guess the other the other thing worth mentioning is we talked about it uh, um, before, but um, you know, as an additional tool, you know, for those uh, for those Pazians or Vanuans or self liberators who are going to get some of these early prototypes, um, and uh, you know, help out with you know some of the testing and feedback potentially. Um, we we've also talked about uh, you know um, you've been writing up to writing up a bunch of documentation for this, um, actually putting this out in the form of a book or a user's manual or a guide or something via other publications. So um, that's a possibility too. Um, but yeah, all this stuff just takes time and um, yeah, there's there's uh, oh yeah, there's, that's there's that's projects. definitely happening. That's mm-hmm. yeah, that's definitely in the works. Um, it's it's a massive undertaking because I need to forget how far I'm into it and. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff that I would gloss over if I was, like, making a summary for someone maybe nearly as up to speed as me. So it's just not really one of my strengths. But I'm I'm doing it. it it's, uh, it's all coming together. Like, the stuff that I've sent you seems to, uh, I mean, you seem to understa- understand what I'm getting at. And, uh, you know... Just the way I'm wired cognitively, it's very hard for me not to uh, just focus on the, you know, the introverted thinking of the logic of why it's better and, you know, the technicalities. Like I go on and on about, you know, what GPU and, and like no one but geeks like me care about that part. And it's hard for me to explain the stuff that I feel like is obvious to me, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely understand. I make good words sometime. <laughs> no, I, I def, definitely understand. I definitely understand. And I actually did. I, whenever you're talking a couple times throughout this, you know how that for that first ghost phone advertisement, I just took out a couple of clips from uh, one of our one of our, previ- our previous conversations. Well, I got it. I just I thought of another one as you uh, were talking today. So there'll be another one at some point. A um, couple clips. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, Very cool. Some, those are a cu- couple of really really good really good parts. Um, as a, as a lot of them are obviously, but just a couple couple ones to stand out. Um, I guess uh, we, we've gotten through all of uh, we've gotten through the entire ghost system. Um, obviously, people can uh, can keep a lookout on your where I guess a lot of the stuff's probably already available on your website, and uh, we'll get some stuff av- available um, via the you know, publication site too. Um, that crypto crypto venue and bundle or whatever whatever we're going to end up calling it the uh, ghost pad, the ghost phone, and a uh, Faraday bag um, for the phone um, as well. So I guess um, as before before uh, I close this out, Jamin, um, any other, uh, I guess, anything else you want to leave the listeners with on the ghost system or privacy or liberation or I guess uh, anything? Uh, no, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I'll, I'll leave with the word autonomy. <laughs> like it's been really, uh, it's been really, um, 
the, the, the rhetoric to describe the autonomy I'm talking about is kind of on, on the tip of my tongue, you know, like, um, you know, listening to the, to coming, what's coming out of the mouthpieces of like the World Economic Forum talking about people are going to basically have nothing and be happy with that, right? We're going to own nothing and be happy with it. And that's really what all these projects are fighting. Like, the pot's already boiling. People already don't own their digital, the devices they use to access the digital world, the device that their digital persona is tied to, like two sides of a coin. Like, any more people's ID, you know, your default ID is the SIM card in your phone. Like, that's what ties your physical meat bag to the internets at this point. Um, and, you know, that ID needs to be broken somehow. And that's, you know, the ghost phone is, you know, really that's the prime use case for that is because it's easy to break that identification with your your name and everything else to that, um, that SIM chip. And it doesn't matter that it's difficult to do that for, you know, nation state level actors. It's easy to do it for the intelligence agencies they have in, you know, they're controlling to collect the data, which are the social media companies and the Googles and Facebooks of the world. Like those are the collection arm. And if you can hide that stuff from them and hide your identity from them and hide your, your SIM card from your, you know, actual name, then the geofence warrants aren't going to come in your mailbox. You're not going to get the phone call. Um, you know, it's, you know, that that's where the, what I mean by autonomy is like people don't, people don't realize the level they've lost. Right. And, yeah, yes, and you, you don't realize the level that you've lost until you actually get on. And this is what I was going to end on. Uh, I guess my, my what was com coming to mind for me is that um, all of these things, like, they, it's cumulative and it kind of snowballs after a point. Like, just, just starting with the ghost phone, like, you're going to feel um, just being it, like, seeing how much, how locked down you, you've been on, like, the Android, like, the, the normal Google Android or, um, you know, an iPhone, a spy phone. Um, seeing how locked down you are and how much more freedom there is on the open source platforms, they work better. Um, like the the mobile the the phone is I mean the um, yeah the the phones are the phones are incredible work work far better. Um, and it was a lot easier to get the number for Bit uh, paid in Bitcoin than it was to deal with the assets at AT and T for my white ghost um, my white ghost phone. So um, so yeah I mean there's every reason in the, every reason in the world um, to go with these these free and open source open, open source alternatives if the privacy isn't enough for you. Um, then the conveniences too, because um, just as what's happening, transpiring in, um, you know, the physical, uh, physical babble on the physical servile society, um, that say those same restrictions, that same, um, that same, um, you know, um, that same enslavement is coming, you know, coming, you know, vis-a-vis -vis these, these, uh, you know, digital tools too. Um, that uh, in the first round they really are conveniences. Um, so let's turn those conveniences into actual like benefits to our liberation and not just like handing over information to adversaries for whatever purposes. So um, I guess as, as I kind of always tell you, Jam, and I'm appreciative for all the work you've done over the past like 20 plus years um, and the, in the areas of privacy, um, your, your your expertise is definitely showing. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to try all these things out myself and get them out to the larger, you know, um, volume self liberator and Pasadena network. So yeah. Um, yeah, there's every reason in the world to use these things, and uh, it's time, time, it's 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 past time to, to use them. Oh, for sure. I really appreciate being on here, and I, yeah, likewise with all, all the, uh, you know, actionable stuff that you get out there to people. I mean, it's really easy to poke, poke holes in theories, and you know, enumerate what the problems are, but like, strategies where people are getting up and doing something is the way. The way forward here yeah yeah certainly certainly um so i guess uh that's that's all i've got anything else shane before i let you go man no thanks for having me on shane okay cool all right guys uh, and there you have it uh, jamie mcconnick 
Um, back to talk about the ghost system. Um, keep a lookout for uh, you know all sorts of cool stuff um, uh, in that area. The Crypto Penuum Bundle, whatever we decide to officially name it. Um, for one, that's a terrific start to what we've covered today. If you felt overwhelmed at all, don't. Um, there's no reason to. We um, cover these things one step at a time. I start with the ghost. I, I start with the ghost pad, I guess, just very loosely. Over the past couple of years, ghost phone this year, and, uh, and I'm ready to take on some 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 more stuff and and uh, you know increase my um, you know, my my uh, self sovereignty in the digital and physical realm. So. Um, I guess uh, other, I guess just closing notes here, uh, the Pazzini website has gotten a complete overhaul. Um, there's still more to do, but it's gotten a complete overhaul. Um, check out the new Pazzini store if you happen to take a look. Uh, it's pazzini.com. And uh, I've, I've incorporated, um, it's not the final iteration of what it's going to be, but I've, I've, uh, I've implemented BTC Pay Server on both the Pazzini site and the LUA site. Um, it's the first step towards transitioning oh, nice. to um, our own self-hosted payments uh, and donations infrastructure, uh, much like what we've been discussing all episode today. Um, so this opens up the potential oh, yeah, for, yeah. Uh, for BTC yep. Lightning payments too. But um, after, uh, I guess I, I was kind of like looking forward to Lightning last year, but I'm not sure if I actually want to uh, want to venture in that area at this point. I might stick with on-chain Bitcoin, but um, but we'll see. Um, I've, I've begun I've begun kind of experimenting in that realm too. Um, so I can I can let oh, you. Oh know, yeah, man! After we get this, yeah, after we get this XMPP server going. I'm I'm totally down for helping out with the uh, BTC full node because I was going to do that for my site as well. So just cool. be doing it twice. Yeah, yeah. And so for right now, um, there's a there's an a, an outfit called Voltage who you can spin up a, a Lightning node or a BTC pay server um, with like like two minutes. So I haven't done the Lightning node net yet because I don't think I'm going to venture in that down that realm at this point. Like I said, but um, I did put set up the BTC pay server stores, and all it, all it takes is redirecting on the. And I got them all set up in the WordPress too, and that was kind of the um, one item. Um, yeah, very very easy. I'm 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 really impressed with it. And uh, once it actually gets self-hosted, like what we're talking about, maybe, maybe putting it on Linode or something, um, then uh, yeah, I think that's. Uh, it opens up a lot of a lot of interesting possibilities um, for maybe um, maybe we could open up a uh, uh, set up a donation or I guess set up a donation uh, fund or campaign for um, for you know the networking I guess the hardware that we need for for all these things potentially because BTC Pay Server has a really neat kind of uh, feature like that um, and then yeah just the self-hosted payments too where you don't have to give up your um, for a lot of the like if you're going to um, use a lot of these third-party like uh, uh, Bitcoin processing avenues or whatever, they'll, they'll require you to put in your XPUB key, um, which um, basically lets them watch okay. all the addresses in, in the wallet. It's unfortunate, um, but yeah, like it's it's one of those third-party vulnerabilities. If you don't do it yourself, then um, you're going through these this convenient this convenient route. So um, it's a BDC pay server is a big step up um, for for a lot of reasons. And just all, as we're as we've been talking about all day today, or I guess all episode today, um, getting all this stuff self-hosted and not not giving that data or not not having a third party um, there to have any data on you at all is the is the maximum um, the only sure way to to be sure about these things so um, yeah I guess that's uh, that pretty much covers it vonniepodcast.com for all things Vonnie and uh, Pasnia.com for all things the free republic and uh, yeah until next time guys always remember uh, Vonnie was yours for the making and the second realm is yours for the building cheers Because that's really the issue that we're dealing with with these, you know, ghost phones, ghost pads, whatever, is that there's no way that you can organize with with other people and have these distributed tribes if you have a snitch in your pocket all the time. Mm -hmm. People are literally wearing wires all the time. They have a snitch in their pocket and they're trying to do clandestine things. That's never going to work. I'm focused on this project now because I really see how the unfettered flow of communication is what really has prompted this, you know, shift in consciousness. And that if this does, if this can't continue this way and people can't communicate freely with each other, then all the dis distributed networks that have formed um, aren't going to be very effective and they're not going to, uh, they're not going to be able to do what they could do. Um, if you can't communicate, especially when you're basically part of a dispersed tribe at this point, if you can't communicate without being monitored, it basically hamstrings anything, you know, anything going forward. 
Step up your privacy and order a ghost phone today. Just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash ghost phone, again libertyunderattack.com forward slash ghost phone. And make sure to keep a lookout for more ghost pads, privacy tools, freedom boxes, and more. Libertyunderattack.com is the website. Liberty Under Attack Publications. Share your story, find your freedom. the second volume in the Brushfire thriller series, takes place in the not-so-distant future. In the second half of the 21st century, the war of ideas took place. The creation of second realms and individualist decentralized freedom cells spread across geographical regions, and the practical ideas of liberty, voluntary interaction, and peace took hold. The Free Society in 2048 is loosely based on Samuel E. Konkin III's Phases of Agorism, in which the destruction of the state would be realistically accomplished for the establishment of pockets of free individuals, black and gray markets, and the spreading of the ideas of freedom and liberty, until the demand for an overarching state was no longer perceived as essential, and individualism and voluntary interaction prevailed. The original creators of the freedom cells who led the world to a better place are still scattered about living their lives, including Maxine, the late Henry Tucker's love, and the now washed up but stubborn punk rocker Warren, still reside in the Appalachian Mountains. Maxine's nephew, Vince, and his boy Tommy, who had been band nomads ever since Tommy's mom left to pursue a materialistic quest for fortune in the never-ending rat race, went to visit Auntie Max on her homestead on Jim Mountain Road. Although Max is very happy for the visit, she has an ulterior motive. Her close friend she met during her revolutionary days, Isaac Hopper, is trapped in a geographical area previously known as New York City, now known as the State Zone. The State Zone is one of only a handful of remnant states where an overarching power-hungry government rules over its citizens with aggressive force. Together, Warren, Vince, and Tommy team up and use their knowledge, including advanced hacking techniques, low-tech ciphers, IRC encrypted chat, and cryptocurrencies to infiltrate and evade the authorities in the state zone and bring back Isaac to freedom. But their mission, the rescue of Isaac, Auntie Max's close friend and confidant, isn't going to be easy. They are up against a powerful authoritarian Hydra state, a massive surveillance apparatus, a relentless and murderous police state, and a propaganda arm that will not stop until extremist terrorists known as the TRIO, Warren, Vince, and Tommy, are brought to justice. Will the TRIO pull off the rescue of Max's longtime friend, Isaac Hopper? Will the forces of good, free individuals, prevail against the safest forces of evil? Find out in the second volume of the Brushfire Thriller series, 2048, available exclusively via Liberty Attack Publications. Just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048, or snag them both in the Brushfire Bundle. libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048 bundle. Libertyunderattack Publications, share your story, find your freedom.